Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Baumel. I am a medical oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I am so pleased to welcome you to the Cancer Grace ASCO ESMO update. Uh, so this is, this is great. And I have some fantastic friends and colleagues here to talk about all the updates from head and neck cancer at these big conferences. So joining me today are Dr. Kate Gold uh, from the University of Cal uh, California, San Diego, Dr. Ronnie Mira from the University of Maryland, and Dr. Jared Weiss from the University of North Carolina. So the next study that uh, we should probably talk about was the so-called PEMBRO-RAD study. This was done uh, in Europe through the Gore-Tec Cooperative Group, which I think is I think it's the name of the of cooperative groups, but in any case, um, the the Gore Tech group um, did this study of uh, pembrolizumab with radiation. Dr. Mira, do you want to talk to us a little bit about how it was set up? Sure. So this was a randomized phase two study, and um, it randomized two different chemo radiation, or rather, radiation regimens. One was with cetuximab and radiation. So this was a antibody that targets EGFR. It's an agent that we've been using for head and neck cancer with radiation for over a decade. Um, cetuximab and radiation has an interesting history in that it was first uh, received its, its data and approval based on a randomized trial comparing it to radiation alone. And I think its use has waxed and waned through the years and probably more waned <laughs> in the past few years. Um, and the experimental arm was pembrolizumab with radiation given at the standard dose of 200 milligrams every three weeks. And the primary endpoint was a 15 month local regional control endpoint. So the trial had about 66 patients per arm to look at the, this question in the phase two setting. Um, it enrolled uh, largely uh, patients who had a smoking history. 60% uh, of them were patients who had disease in the oropharynx. About half of them were P16 positive. Um, majority or at least half of the patients had higher volume nodal disease um, and the median follow-up was about two years. Um, the toxicity I think was largely what's expected with, with radiation when you try to include a systemic agent with it. Uh, and again, um, you know, I think there was a lot of uh, hope that perhaps the addition of a checkpoint inhibitor with radiation would, would move the needle in the field. Um, the uh, what was really found though was that the overall um, or the two year progression free survival was really similar uh, in the two groups. And there was no difference in, um, or, uh, you know, the efficacy based on, on the endpoint. Um, overall survival also was, was not significantly different. The hazard ratio was 0.83, which, you know, doesn't show that it's not as much of a, a difference between the groups as we would have really wanted. Um, so, uh, so this trial didn't really, you know, help guide us with, uh, also with how to incorporate immunotherapy with, with radiation in a randomized setting. Um, it wasn't a randomized trial to platinum, which is the drug that we often use in this setting. And so I guess, um, you know, uh, but still cetuximab is, is something that has been used through the years and, and didn't seem to be an improvement over that. Yeah, and, and this study was specifically targeting people who were not eligible to get cisplatin. Dr. Weiss, you did some work in this space as well, right? So can you tell us a little bit about how you treat patients who are not platinum eligible? Yeah, so I'm very passionate about this space because it's a big problem in my clinic. Um, it probably varies a lot by where you practice. In my practice, more than a third of my patients have either an absolute cisplatin contraindication or a strong relative contraindication. Um, cisplatin, the only nice thing I can say about cisplatin is that it improves the cure rate a little bit. Um, and then it's all downhill from there. It's a very toxic drug. And it's not just suffering in the short term, um, because I think, you know, imagining if I had a head and neck cancer, I'd be willing to go through a lot in a few months if it rendered me disease free to enjoy quality life for decades thereafter. I think many of my patients feel the same. Um, but thinking about cisplatin, a lot of its side effects can be permanent. Uh, in my practice, the biggest problem I see is hearing loss and tinnitus, uh, ear problems. Um, uh, perhaps it's proximity uh, uh, to a large military and veteran population, but 
Um, I have a lot of patients with very significant hearing loss coming in, and I don't want to make them deaf uh, with cisplatin. I think it's become less of a problem in recent years, but uh, nephropathy or kidney damage um, is a big problem. Uh, a lot of our older patients come in with imperfect kidney function, uh, and uh, we don't want to hurt them. Um, and the other big one I see in my practice is neuropathy, um, nerve damage. Um, a lot of my patients have diabetes or other disorders that um, give this the, them this tingling in the tips of their fingers and toes. And if you start off with a little bit of tingling and you give this plot and you can end up with pain or even trouble performing fine motor tasks like buttoning or unbuttoning a shirt or walking. And so we're talking about things that really affect the human experience, right? That are uh, big influences on quality of life. And so I, I really dislike cisplatin and I would have liked to have seen this um, be a more positive study. Um, I'd like something better for my patients. What do we have right now? Um, we have, uh, as Dr. Mira nicely explains the tuximab, but um, I agree uh, interest in it is waning as um, uh, increasingly data set after data set call into question just how effective it is both in the HPV positive patient and perhaps in everyone. Um, and also that call into question whether it's a bit more toxic uh, than we had really thought. And that brings me to one of my major thoughts about that, one of my major points of optimism about this study um, is the toxicity profile. So it's very different between the two drugs. Uh, with cetuximab, there was uh, more skin effects, uh, more dermatitis, more rash, more uh, mouth uh, sores, mucositis. And really the only thing we saw more of with pembrolizumab is throwing off the thyroid. And I think that uh, both in terms of the absolute numbers, uh, there were fewer uh, severe side effects with pembrolizumab, 74% compared to 92% with cetuximab. But going beyond the data, not all side effects cause the same amount of suffering, right? Uh, it's not all just about the numbers. Uh, and in terms of the things that really hurt patients and that you feel, I think pembrolizumab radiation therapy here uh, really came out uh, quite a bit ahead. And, and Dr. Gold, so we've heard sort of just the overall picture from Dr. Mira. We heard um, Dr. Weiss's uh, severe distaste for cisplatin, which has multiple meanings in this setting. Um, but uh, what is your takeaway? So moving forward, we've now seen data, certainly safety, some, some efficacy data, what is your level of excitement for incorporating radiation with pembrolizumab or immunotherapy into your patients moving forward? You know, this was another really disappointing trial. We all wanted to bring immunotherapy into this setting. I think that's safe to say. And now with the Javelin trial, we have negative results with a PDL1 inhibitor. Now we have negative results with a PD1 inhibitor. Um, and honestly, beating cetuximab is not that high a bar. As my colleagues have said, you know, it's not that great a drug. It's pretty toxic. The outcomes are probably less than, worse than with our more standard chemo radiation. So, you know, this was another trial that I think I was expecting to be positive, that I was disappointed that it was negative. As Dr. Weiss mentioned, you know, I think the tolerability was pretty good and that that's great news, but another negative trial. And I think to me, this is a sign that immunotherapy at the same time as radiation may not be a good idea. You know, the timing issues again here are big. In lung cancer, we improve outcomes by giving immunotherapy after chemo radiation. Could the same be true of head and neck cancer? And hopefully we'll get some of those answers with ongoing trials. Yeah. But this really decreases my excitement for doing more trials with radiation at the same time as immunotherapy. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. To me, this trial it was sort of presented by the author as they were equivalent, but that is a huge failure here. I mean, cetuximab has been shown in now multiple series, as everyone was saying, to be not that great, and we couldn't beat it with pembrolizumab, um, and that's problematic. So I, I don't have as much confidence in this, uh, certainly in the concurrent strategy of giving it at the same time as radiation, for patients who are not eligible for platinum. And I think that this remains a clear gap where we need to improve outcomes for our patients. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I might be the perpetual optimist here, maybe because I'm already invested in this area and won't let go, but uh, I, I actually think there's still a lot of hope here. So I think it is possible that the concurrent combination isn't as good as we thought it was. Um, I would note there's a non-randomized uh, study by a very good looking author um, that uh, had much more favorable, sorry, that was funnier in my head, um, that had uh, much more favorable results than that shown here, despite a higher risk population, but maybe more to the point. 
is the num a number of ongoing studies looking at other uses of immunotherapy concurrent with attempts at cure. We've mentioned that there are studies um, giving uh, immunotherapy out back. I think those guys aren't quite as good looking, but you know, there are also a number that was a shot at you, Josh. Sorry if that was still not funny. I'll keep trying. Um, but you know, there are also you know certain things are self evident, so I just accept them and we can move on. That's fine. But there, there are uh, there are other studies looking at other contexts as well. There are a number of studies looking at neoadjuvant or giving uh, immunotherapy before the the standard attempt at cure, either on its own or in combination with chemo. And here it's important to note that chemo has a very high response rate in that area, at least if you choose the right chemo. Um, so I, I think this isn't quite dead yet. I think that the the exact uh, stuff done here. I'll admit it's disappointing. It's not what I was hoping for. I was looking for a massive gain and lots more cured patients, but I don't think we're done yet. I think that there may be uh, salvageability here for, for these immunotherapy drugs and improving, improving cure rates, just doing this a little bit differently. Well, they're not radiation sensitizers, right? And you know, in our field, we are told to give radiation sensitizers with radiation. So we just need to rethink how we're approaching it. So that may be the uh, perfect concluding thought um, because it allows me to say, stay tuned and check out um, the uh, podcast on Debio 1143 with radiation, which I promise has more optimistic results than what we just shared with you. Mm -hmm.